So my topic is a little bit different from uh, the, the, the topic of, of others. Um, it's actually about r and uh, internationalization. Uh, it, it's related to trade, actually. Um, so um, first of all, uh, the reason, the motivation for this is because uh, as, at least in some quarter, there's a lot of discussion that uh, the uh, BR, BRI can actually enhance the internationalization of r and &B. And there is actually a few things that can affect uh, a few dimensions uh, uh, in which uh, the internationalization of, a, of the currency can be enhanced. So this is the list. And so I would just say that uh, what are the possible contribution uh, of BRI to RMB internationalization? There are two possibilities. And this is uh, kind of related to what uh, Song Bo has uh, presented. The first is, I think, uh, is through the RMB uh, used as a payment currency. Uh, and that is uh, through the mechanism that uh, as trade flow increases, uh, China's trade flow with, uh, with these uh, BRI countries increases, it will use, uh, tend to use the uh, renminbi as a settlement currency, a trade settlement currency or trade invoicing currency. Uh, and trade, trade flow can increase for two reasons. What's the, one is the re reduction of trade costs, as uh, Songbo has said. Uh, and the other is, uh, I, I imagine that it is uh, due to, uh, you know, more ODI. Uh, the second reason why R&B uh, internationalization can be enhanced uh, by BRI is through the increase in the amount of international debt securities uh, issued uh, by, uh, by, by Chinese entities in uh, R&B uh, uh, denominated ones, R&B denominated international debt security. What, what do I mean by that? It's some it's bonds, basically some bonds, RMB bonds, such as uh, uh, what we call a dim sum bonds, for example, uh, if you've heard of it. So uh, these two channels uh, will uh, enhance RMB internationalization. Okay, so basically this is uh, what I, what I, so, so two things, remember, I'm going to focus on two things. One is the payment currency, RMB, to be used as a payment currency will increase as a result of increasing trade flows. And the second one is RMB to be used as a, to denominate international bonds. Okay, so these are the two things. So first of all, I want to talk about the uh, RMB as a payment currency. As I said, there are two possible channels. One is I, I conjecture that uh, is going to increase trade flow uh, between China and the BNR countries through the, you know, uh, outward direct investment from China that will boost uh, export, but also perhaps also according to uh, Sungbo's mechanism also increased imports. So in any case, uh, I, uh, this is going to be increasing uh, the payment flow of RMB because RMB as a payment currency, RMB will be used as a uh, uh, settlement currency and invoicing currency more because of uh, China trade. So I, the way I try to uh, estimate this quantitatively is through a gravity model. Uh, because of a shortage of time, I don't think I can actually go through this uh, gravity model of, uh, in detail. Uh, suffice it to say is that this is coming from uh, uh, basically this gravity model is trying to uh, estimate the determinants of bilateral intercountry country RMB den denominated payment flows. And it's coming from a proprietary data set from SWIFT. SWIFT is a payment uh, uh, is a payment uh, um, uh, organization. Uh, I got this proprietary data and then I uh, I have this bilateral intercountry payment flow by currency data and I just focus on 30 uh, 
30 countries, uh, uh, actually a union of the 30 countries, Inbang and Maobang, are focused on RMB payments. So here is my uh, result. Uh, I, I'm not going to go through very detail of this result. This is just a gravity uh, model, which says that, you know, you the payment, RMB payment from country I to country J is determined by the GDP of country I, GDP of country J, and some uh, some kind of payment friction, and also uh, trade costs. Here, here we have the, you know, a DIG, which is the trade cost, which is related to some uh, uh paper. And then here is also a trade share uh, between, you know, China and the and the uh, destination or the uh, origin country. So uh, without going through the uh, mechanism of, of this, uh, this, I just want to say that, okay, my, my methodology, my strategy is I try to do a thought experiment. I say, okay, suppose this trade, that's trade share. This trade share means, uh, what do I mean by that? I mean, like, for example, uh indonesia uh you know what is the percentage of china trade in indonesia in indonesia's total trade that's what mean, i mean by trade share and suppose this trade share of indonesia increase uh trade share of indonesia with china increase by a certain percentage okay okay so so my thought experiment is therefore suppose all the uh, trade share of the all the BNL countries with China increased by 50%. How is it going to affect RMB uh, payment flow in the aggregate? In the aggregate. So here's my result. So my result is the following: If BRI is implemented, was implemented in 2016, it's a counterfactual thought experiment. If it was implemented in 2016, and if the shares of China's trade of each BI country in 2016 was increased by 50% as a result of that, it would increase total global RMB denominated payments in 2016 by 16%, which means that it will increase a flow of US dollar 2.92 trillion. It sounds like a large number, right? But in fact, uh, it is not a, such a large number when you consider the actual total amount of uh, of uh, payment flow in 2016 is actually in the order of uh, is in the order of uh, something I think some, something like a thousand trillion. Uh, it, it's a it's a huge number. Is in a is a is in the order of uh, something of a thousand trillion dollar of payment flow uh, total in the in, in in that year, so it's actually a very small number. So I'm going to say that the bottom line is that the impact is going to be very small. So the impact on RMB internationalization, to the extent that our, that BRI uh, increases the payment flow of RMB of RMB, the effect is actually going to be very small. Uh, even though the, the magnitude, the, 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 the magnitude itself, the absolute number seems to be huge. So uh, see here, I just tell you these are the uh, the payment, the uh, share, the trade shares of these countries, the 10 largest BNL uh, trading partners of China as of 2016, you, you can see that, uh, you know, these are, um, you know, similar to what uh, 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 Song Bo has presented. I'm just assuming that these are all increased, going to be increased by 50%. Okay. In, in actually, all of them increased by 50%. That is the consequence, 2.92 trillion dollars of RMB payment flow. Okay, so then let's look at the other thing is about trade costs. That's why I keep asking Song Bo about uh, how much is the trade cost reduced. And I here I assume that the trade cost 
is going to be reduced by 10%, okay? So I, I just actually look at some estimation uh, by other people. There is a uh, paper by uh, the, so uh, the uh, Suarez uh, in the World Bank. There's a World Bank working paper, which actually talks about uh, the reduction of trade costs. So I take the estimate from there, and I, I actually feel that a 10% reduction of trade costs is actually quite a lot. Uh, based on what they have uh, estimated. So here's my thought experiment. We assume that the bilateral trade cost reduced by 10% among any pair of the following countries, China, Hong Kong, Singapore, Thailand, Philippines, Indonesia. These, why do I look at this? This is because these are the countries that lie along this uh, corridor. Uh, and they are the most important ones it, as, as, as far as trade is concerned. And I also assume that the, the bilateral trade uh, cost also reduced by 10% uh, among these countries that lie on the that lie on this corridor, on, on, on this other corridor. Okay, these are the, so I will capture the first order effect of this, of, uh, of uh, trade cost reduction. And my result is that the result is very, very modest. It will increase the total global RMB denominated payment by only 0.8%, very modest. So here's my conclusion. It will, uh, I can tell you that without BRI, just a counterfactual thought experiment, okay? In 2016, without BRI, this is the actual payment share of the renminbi, 1.62%. US dollar 55%. So it is tiny compared with uh, US dollar, of course. So as a payment currency, as a payment currency, okay, the US dollar is, of course, by far the largest one. The renminbi in 2016, 1.6%. Rank number eight below Australian, Australian dollar. So here's Australian dollar. Uh, this is Swiss franc, Canadian dollar, British pound, Japanese yen, Euro, US dollar. So you can see here's the packing order without BRI. How about with BRI? With BRI, I assume that these other numbers are unchanged. RMB's share, 1.9. 1.62 becomes 1.9. With a very optimistic, very generous uh, kind of uh, uh, counterfactual, it only makes a small dent and doesn't affect the rank uh, of the RMB as a payment currency. Okay. Uh, now, the next thing is about another aspect of uh, internationalization of a currency, which is about RMB denominated international debt securities. In other words, in RMB denominated bonds, RMB denominated international bonds. Okay, so uh, the reason why it will boost is because uh, RMB is uh, because because it, RMB bonds may be issued to finance these projects. So how do I estimate this? Now this estimation is uh, is really a, it's kind of like a back of envelope calculation. Please forgive me. Uh, at this stage, uh, I, I do a sort of a, some sort of a extrapolation. So, so I, let me just tell you the current situation in as of 2020, 2020 quarter one, out of a total 24.91 trillion uh, US dollar worth of outstanding stock of international debt securities, um, the currency denomination of these international debt securities are as follows. 47% are denominated in US dollar, 38% denominated in Euro, 8% in British pound, and so on. And renminbi is 0.41%, way down. And I don't even know what is the rank, uh, very small. So. What is my uh, bottom line, therefore, 
my bottom line, I, I can tell you that uh, without going uh, through the slides, is that again, I it's going to be not a very big, uh, it's not going to boost this percentage a lot. I well, I'm sorry. Let me just take it, take it back. In fact, it boosts this uh, 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 quite a lot, but it still does not cannot make the RMB go past British pound uh, in 10 years time. So my 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 thought experiment is to try to uh, try to predict. Uh, what is the rank of RMB uh, in this packing order in 10 years times in uh, uh, 2030? Okay, this is my thought experiment. So what do I do? First of all, first of all, uh, okay. So anyway, this is um, not um, not very important. So I assume that there is an additional amount of six trillion US dollar worth of investment in the BRI in the next 35 years. How do I get these numbers? Well, I, I don't have uh, a lot of time to explain this, but I, all I can tell you is that if you read the documents, uh, you can conclude that uh, the media has reported that there's going to be somewhere between four trillion and eight trillion dollars going to be invested in the BRI. Okay, and how long is that period? Again, nobody knows how long it is going to be. Nobody knows exactly how much investment that is going to be, but it's just a some sort of a uh, educated uh, guess. So six trillion dollars seems to be reasonable. How about the time time length? Well, I think that 35 years is not it is actually quite uh, reasonable because uh, uh, you know again it's gassing you know Price Water Price Waterhouse Cooper PwC will have estimate that they say that okay maybe uh, they want to celebrate the 100 years by the 100 years anniversary of the People's Republic of China would be a good time uh, to celebrate the uh, you know the completion of most of the you know BRI uh, initiative. Okay, so let's get let's think about 2050. Okay, being the hundredth anniversary. So 35, uh, or in this case, actually we're talking about 2055 from now. Okay, 2055. Uh, okay, so that's kind of reasonable. Uh, you know, so in other words, I you know, 0 0.86 trillion dollars worth of investment. Uh, so, sorry, half of half of this six trillion. Let's say, give it a very sort of generous guess. Uh, okay, half of this six trillion dollar is going to be financed by RMB bonds. That's a very, very generous, optimistic kind of assumption. And that would give you a 0.86 trillion worth of, you know, bond, uh, uh, you know, RMB denominated bonds in 10 years. In 10 years, okay, in the next 10 years. So what is the, uh, okay, sorry. Uh, so therefore, without make a long story short. Um, so first of all, I have to. Again, talk about without BRI and with BRI, right? So first of all, without BRI, I kind of, uh, I use some extrapolation and say, okay, without even without BRI, just because, uh, you know, China's uh, opening up and other, and other measures, uh, you know, the, the quality of RMB denominated international bond is still going to grow very, very fast. Uh, and therefore by 2030, 10 years from now, uh, in an optimistic uh, scenario, it will be the RMB will consist of 2.7% of the 
of the total amount of international debt security issued. We'll bypass Japanese yen already. So how do I get we're at, we're at 20 minutes now, so you might want okay, to- Okay, okay, I can, uh, I can actually read a lot. So, so this is pro, uh, some extrapolation result. Now, suppose with BRI, okay, remember this is with BRI, which is uh, the story that I just told um, with the, um, you know, uh, 0.83 trillion dollar worth of RMB denominated bonds to be issued, uh, you know, in the next decade. And, um, and that will get, give the uh, RMB's uh, share to 5.4%. A very, very optimistic scenario, of course, because uh, of what I just said. Uh, it will double. It will basically, the R, uh, BRI will double, according to this, if you compare this 2.7 with 5.4. So BRI will double the percentage, the share of RMB in international debt security. But still, it's not going to be a huge uh, jump in the rank of RMB. Uh, is 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 still below the 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 pound the pound sterling. This is the pound sterling, right? And remember, I, my 5.4 is a very very optimistic number. It can easily be half or a quarter. Okay. So, um, in other words, uh, so it can put. I mean, it is the chances are 10 years from now. There is a possibility that RMB will be ahead of the Japanese yen. Okay, in in uh, international denomination of international debt security, but there is almost no hope that it will uh, be above the the other top three in ten years' time. Okay, so here is my conclusion. Uh, in my other uh, in my other uh, research. I have uh, pointed out that uh, RMB internationalization depends on two pillars. The first is financial development and the other is capital account openness. And these are the two Im most important factors that will boost the RMB's uh, internationalization. So BRI, to the extent that BRI increases the use of RMB for international payment and denominating international debt security, the effects are too small to have any substantial impact on international RMB, unless they have impact on the financial development of the onshore market, or they have impact on the capital account openness. If they don't, then the, the effect is going to be very limited. So that is my uh, conclusion. That's it, thank you. Okay, so, great. Um, there's a question in the Q and A, Edwin, that says, "How will China, China's push for a digital yuan and the blockchain-based network impact the increase in renminbi denominated <laughs> payments?" It's not really about BRI, but I guess it's That's about. That's right. It's not about BRI. I, I don't know whether I should I should answer that question, but my short answer is that uh, I don't know <laughs> because I I'm very curious. As well, I mean, I mean, people have been talking about that. I'm very, uh, I'm very ignorant about uh, how digital currency can uh, can enhance RMB internationalization. I like to learn more. Yeah. So, I I see Lee Jones has uh, risen his hand. Lee Jones, is that from before, or is this a, a new question? It's, it's for now. Um, thanks, right. Edwin. That was a very interesting presentation. Um, yeah. I have two questions. One is, um, I mean, I think what your presentation really shows is the continued power of, U of um, US dollar hegemony, which is a you know, very abiding source of, of American power. On, right. uh, on the, um, the sort of limited rise of, of RMB use, I guess part of the explanation is that, you know, China is still very much a latecomer to international financial markets, right? And even, and even big uh, increases actually don't make that much of a dent uh, given that. But what kind of assumptions are you making around the use of RMB in 
in in trade why why does it seem that um trading partners will be reluctant to denominate uh trade in rmb and not use it more uh, the rate of that seemed surprisingly surprisingly small actually much less than the financial side and then the second question is more i think this is more a political question you may not you may not wish to answer it um but um your final slide and your conclusion that using RMB and BRI won't have an impact without capital account liberalization. Hasn't this always been the objective of the People's Bank of China, the reformers within the People's Bank of China, that you pursue things like trade liberalization and RMB internationalization on grounds of, I don't know, national glory or whatever, understanding that at some point you you'll be kind of forced to liberalize the capital account which will trigger a chain reaction of other liberalizations in the political economy so the, the people's bank of china knows this is the case and they they push this agenda because it suits their broader agenda of of reforming the economy that's that's the argument of people like stephen bell and so on i am what's your view on that but, but go ahead edwin oh, okay so um, two, so maybe I, I answer the, the second question first. The second question about uh, capital account liberalization, uh, it, it's, it's more than just a political question. Um, the, okay, so they, the Chinese government does want to push for RMB internationalization, but they later realize that this is not that simple. And they, they need to have paid, they have to pay a cost. The cost is, uh, is cap capital account liberalization and financial market development, in particular capital account liberalization. Capital account opening is a risky exercise because uh, you would have to allow a lot of freedom of capital mobility. Uh, you would have, uh, that can destabilize your financial system if, you, uh, if your financial system is not robust. And this is precisely what China is. Uh, their, 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 their financial system is not that robust. Uh, they, they, uh, they still have uh, a lot of uh, uh, government uh, intervention in the financial market. Uh, they still have the, the, this uh, baggage uh, of the state-owned enterprises to take care of. The banking system has to take care of the state-owned enterprises and therefore the financial market cannot, cannot, cannot be totally marketized cannot be totally market determined. Interest rate cannot be market determined because of that. Uh, and so they have to take care of all these things first before right. they can uh, afford to open the capital account. And therefore they cannot internationalize the RMB uh, because uh, the, 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 it's too high a price to pay. In fact, uh, according to my observation, it's going to be a long, long time before uh, they're going to open the capital account as, as, uh, as liberal as uh, as uh, even, uh, you know, as liberal as, as the European countries, uh, it's a long, long time. Um, and and so, so that's the second question. Uh, the first question is, that, uh, why is it so small? Why RMB is so uh, still, uh, despite the, the fact that the Chinese uh, economy is already the second largest in the world and the largest trading country in the world and RMB is used so small? It, it's really, uh, again, going back to my, my theory, it's, got, it's really the financial market is not, well, it's not open and not well developed and capital account also not, not open. And for that reason, uh, foreigners are not willing to hold r and right. I mean, you, you, people need to, to, to be willing to hold r and uh, uh, for store of value for, um, for, uh, for their asset. You know, they, they need to hold it um, and not just for payment. I mean, if you want people to use it for payment, uh, they will have to use it uh, for store of value as well, uh, as a, also use it as a funding currency, you know, for, for issuing bonds and, and people are willing to hold the bonds. And, uh, you know, uh, are people willing to hold uh, R&B uh, assets as their store of value? That is, is, is really... Uh, uh, something related to uh, whether it's a liquid asset. Is it liquid? I mean, it's like the, you know, can I usually sell my RMB denominated asset uh, 
and, and, and buy something else? Uh, can I uh, do I, do I uh, can I uh, invest in China easily and then and then withdraw the money uh, uh, easily? Uh, so that was that kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. Right. Okay.